to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey, it's episode 104. Today's September 4th, 2018. You're listening to or maybe even watching Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, how are you, Nick? Hey, I'm good. Blake, we got a lot to talk about today. Yeah, we do. We got a lot to talk whole about. A whole bunch today. of stories. Lots uh, of banter. Yeah, a whole, a whole three of them. Uh, so <laughs> we're going to be looking at how scientists are only able to reproduce results for 13 out of 21 human behavior studies. 13 out of 21? That's embarrassing. Bad. Well, we'll talk a little bit we'll, about we'll it. We'll talk about yeah, it. It's, right, it's right, not yeah. good. Uh, how visually impaired can easily navigate with deep way, and we're talking robotic implants too. Blake, before we get into all that, I'm going to check in with you and see how you're doing. Oh, you want to know how I'm doing? I want to know how you're doing. I'm absolutely terrified, Nick. Why are you absolutely terrified? Because I spent a nice holiday weekend here in the States playing too much Call of Duty Zombies. That's why. Call of Duty Zombies. So I'm unfamiliar with the Call of Duty franchise. I know what zombies are, Mm -hmm. and I know that Call of Duty Zombies is some sort of game mode within the Call of Duty franchise. Yeah, okay. So... (laughs) Yeah, so <laughs> Call of Duty Zombies has, I don't know, it's been around for for probably half the franchise's entire life, right? And there's different studios that make them, but this last go from, I think, Infinite Warfare, or maybe it's two goes ago. But anyway, it's it's got a lot of like really creepy elements to it, from the design of like the game itself and the characters and stuff like that. Um, and also, too, if you're not familiar, like something that's really big in them is these long, drawn-out Easter egg hunts inside okay. of the games but is this really quick is this something we can drop in our b-roll yeah it is okay cool. actually hey, yeah look at that that's really good it's a plug for youtube yeah there <laughs> you go and uh so the thing i noticed the most was is there's this particular like map called F- beast from beyond and i was noticing that i was getting literally scared running away from th- these type of zombies called cryptids and i couldn't figure out what was freaking me out like i've played all the zombie games there ever have been okay uh and i noticed it was the sound design it was both like the music oh, yeah. itself and then the like skittering of little claws going across like a hallway plus like also them making these really kind of scary noises from like right. something you would think is almost alien right so question are you when you're playing this mode are you playing with like some surround sound headphones that kind of help with the immersion right so you can hear the click clack behind you yeah, de- that's definitely changed like how I'm able to even play the game because I didn't realize I had, for a long time I never realized that any of those video games were created in a way that you can really hear things from the right side, the left side, right. more towards center. Um, so yeah, I, I have been playing it with headphones on because like to keep the sound really loud. Yeah, that stuff is really scary. I'm glad you brought up sort of this fear uh, in video games because when I was younger and Super Mario 64 was out, I like I would play this game and there were two sound cues that always kind of got to me. I'm going to play them for you right now. So the first one is Bowser's laugh. um, And the second one is an auditory illusion, actually, that a lot of people studying psychology in school right now might know as shepherd's tone. And this is sort of this infinitely scaling um, soundbite where it sounds like the audio is always increasing in pitch, but really it's just overlapping tones where one one fades out, the other one fades in. And just always kind of increase. I'll play an example for you right now. So this is Bowser's laugh uh, right here. Hang on. So there's Bowser's laugh. That is creepy. And then this is the infinite staircase leading up to the final boss battle that won't let you go through unless you... Sorry, I'm getting chills right now just thinking about it. (laughs) This is the shepherd's tone. I I honestly didn't realize that was an auditory illusion. Yeah. If you listen to it, it never... it, It always seems like it's going up. Yeah. Right? But it's actually just like a loop? Yeah, it's actually just a... It's Well, it's a couple different things going on there. So what, what it is, is you have sort of this underlying tone that increases in the scale, and then another tone comes in about halfway through and comes in, and then that keeps happening. So it always sounds like it's increasing in pitch. Yikes. And that goes really well with the visual aspect of it, too. Like right. I think that's part of really what's driving the you know fear factor, if you will. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This infinite hallway where you don't know what's at the end and you can't get to it unless you've completed all the uh, requirements for it. Yikes. That's crazy, man. <laughs> yeah. So, Blake, this is we're recording on a Tuesday because we just had the holiday. Yeah. I had, I had an interesting weekend. I don't really have a whole lot of human factors stuff to talk about, but I do have uh, sort of uh, an, an interesting story to tell 
Um, we are now fostering a cat. And you already have two cats, right? Correct. So you have now three. Yes. So you're a cat daddy for real. Well, and the process of fostering a cat and introducing a cat to existing cats in the household is a tough one. Um, and I know this is this is not human factors by any means, but you it kind of is in a sense where you have to pay really close attention to process and read sort of the, the behavioral cues that the animals are giving off. Because my girls, my, my, two, my two cats... Uh, they are one is very friendly and one is very territorial. And when we brought the friendly one in to uh, the territorial one about uh, a year and a half ago, uh, she it took her a while to get used to it. And we thought maybe it'd be easier to bring in a third cat, um, you know, even just temporarily. Because you've already gone through the process, maybe it would the cat would be a little less territorial territorial perhaps i don't know yeah that's, that was the hope so <laughs> you know it's it's been an interesting process because what we'll do is we'll kind of keep keep new cat cat number three in a separate room all to himself he's getting like a five-star treatment right now basically what's happening is um a relative of ours is is moving back to california but could not find a place for the cat in the meantime so we're taking care of it for three months while she finds a place and uh wraps up stuff from where she's at so um anyway taking care of this cat we we put them in a room getting a five-star treatment they have uh, you know running water um all this other uh amenities if you will like uh, uh, an entire bed to themselves and meanwhile my girls are on the other side of the door and can kind of sniff through right but then you know when we're home we let him kind of roam around in their space we never let them go into our bedroom which is kind of like their sanctuary for now sure um, and it's just been a really interesting process kind of like monitoring how close can we get cat three to cat one and two and how close can we uh, or, or what can cat three get away with that cat one and two are not sort of going to be put off by. And then also what kind of things can we do to facilitate a healthy interaction like feeding them all at the same time associating pairing cat three with good things like food. Uh, so now we're we're we've moved off of free feeding to timed feeding with them. It's just a really interesting thing. That yeah, it sounds like a psychological project at the home with the cats. That's pretty crazy. It really is. It really is. Uh, yeah. And, and another thing is that this cat is eight years old where our cats are uh, four and two. Interesting. Yeah. So that's, got, it's got a whole bunch of learned behaviors you're already having to kind of suss out on your own and then deal with, and then plus try and integrate them with your own cat's behavior. So that's, yeah, that's yeah, a it's, lot to it's deal a with. Really interesting process. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, it's only three months, so that's nice. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a nice trial run. My partner wants to eventually foster cats at some point, um, and this is kind of like a nice trial run for that. So, so what does that mean? Does that mean just like taking care of cats that are looking for homes? Yeah, until they're ready to be adopted or, or whatever. Oh, that's cool. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's a trial run. There you go. We'll see. Super, dude. <laughs> it's, anyway, all that to say, it's been a little stressful around the house. <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> having it, yeah. to deal with that. I have one other thing I wanted to talk about too. So you and I, before the show, kind of had a little show meeting. You might have noticed, listeners, at the top of the show, we are no longer doing kind of this cold open where we talk about what's on the show. We figured we're kind of doing that already with this little preview thing. And um, you'll also notice that the Patreon commercial isn't up there anymore as well. Reason for this is we kind of took a step back and was like, you know what, we we design things for a living this is what we do is we kind of what's the optimal way to present information and so we're thinking about it and you know the patreon commercial we can move around that'll come later um and i just we got to talking a little bit about how interesting it is to design sort of a podcast and design content that is tailored for your demographic yeah it's it's really fun too and once you start thinking about like how and this is something we will have to eventually have like meetings about right but it's designing content and how we distribute it across all the social channels we have. Like, we're right. doing a lot more video content right now. Like, we're on YouTube. But we can also cut a lot of that stuff up and right. put it on Instagram or put it out on Twitter videos and stuff like that. And it's it's just creating, I don't know, it's another way of designing. So if you're basically designing how you're distributing information, that's fun. Yeah, it is It is cool. So if, if you're wondering, what I just wanted to mention that, too, for our listeners. This is kind of like a... Hey, we had a show meeting, and uh, two, it's don't get tripped up by it. We're we're always trying to adjust to make things a better listening experience for you guys. And here's here's another thing too: if you have any feedback, like let us know. We're we're happy to entertain ideas. Um, 
You know, there there are some things that have been suggested in the past that we've actually batted around the idea of, like a this week in human factors history or something like that. Um, yeah, or even like the the biggest example is the change in our names. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we used to have, uh, I'm sure, longtime listeners know we used to have sort of these funny titles, but they didn't really give a good sense of what's uh, in the episode. And and uh, now we have very detailed kind of descriptions of the stories that we're talking about, so that way you can kind of see at a glance what the episode's about yeah without having to look at a description or anything so it's nice yeah thank you reviewer for that one <laughs> yes <laughs> all right so let's move on here we got a couple uh programming notes here we are on the amazon platform now alexa play the latest episode of human factors cast you're welcome uh we're also now on youtube like blake mentioned i'm gonna beg again go like subscribe we need 100 subs uh once we're there we'll stop begging until then until then we'll, until we <laughs> we'll get beg. that domain name yeah, we need the slash name to be Human Factors Cast, and we need your help. Uh, that's it for that. I'm not going to beg more. Uh, we also have that giveaway going for free registration to this year's annual meeting in Philadelphia. The link is in the description to this video or this um, episode, whatever you're viewing on. The link is in there. The contest ends. We're ending it on September 14th, so that way you have enough time to book your hotel, book your flight. Uh, and the winner we're going to announce on the 17th, on the, on the episode that we're dropping on the 17th. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, please go sign up. There's only a, a what, like two weeks left? Yep, Less than like, like 10 days. Yep, 10 days, exactly. So get your entries in. We've already get got your, a good few in there, so I'm really excited. I'm excited too. Yeah, we got we got quite a few entries. So go enter that. Uh, speaking of International uh, HFES 2018, I said that backwards, HFES <laughs> International. <laughs> Blake's dying over here. We'll just say uh, here for the podcast. <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird Tuesday. Uh, it's always weird when we record on Tuesdays, I found out. We just did, need to, did you find that out? I, yeah, just <laughs> just now. We need to get back to our Monday schedule. Yeah, we did that last week too, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, we did because you were sick. Yep. So, <laughs> it, but it, we, it was a good show. So let's it hope was, this is yeah, another yeah. good one, right? I think this is a good show so far. Well, it, there's always room to go downhill, so we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> so HFES International 2018. That's uh, from October 1st through the 5th. Uh, like I said, time and time again, we're gonna have plenty of programming coming out of that. Um, we're gonna be at a booth, all that stuff. Please come see us. Uh, it's going to be tons of fun, exciting week. We also got HFES Australia coming to Perth in November from the 26th to the 28th. We'll have some coverage coming out of that. Uh, hopefully our listener, Mateo, will uh, be able to help us break down all the stories coming out of Perth. Yes. That'll be great. All right. Well, Blake, you know what time it is? Uh, I think I do. All right. Well, let me make sure the fader's up so we can play. It's time for Human Factors News. <laughs> I just had to make sure the theater was up. It's a Tuesday, Blake. What do you expect? <laughs> what are we doing? It's a Tuesday. It's a Tuesday. All right. This is the part oh, of the show man. where we talk about all about Human Factors news. So we talk about everything related to the field of Human Factors. It's be anything from, we got some medical in there today. We got some psychology. And we got some robots and maybe maybe robotic implants and stuff. We got some fun stuff today. Wide yeah. variety today for w- sure. Wide Super variety. excited. Even though it's only uh, three stories, we got some heavy stuff to talk about. We do. So why don't we go ahead and get into that first news story? First up, so the latest efforts to reproduce scientific findings, this time in the field of social sciences, has produced definitely lukewarm results. So if the results in every published study can't be replicated in subsequent experiments, how can you trust what you're reading in scientific journals? Well, one international group of researchers is well aware of the reproducibility crisis and has been striving to hold scientists accountable. For their most recent test, they attempted to reproduce 21 studies from two of the top scientific journals, both Science and Nature, that were published between 2010 and 2015. Remarkably, only 13 of the reproductions produced the same results as the original study. Efforts to reproduce older studies do seem to be changing science for the better, however. The changes faced... In these 21 paper, the cha- the challenges faced in these 21 papers and those elucidated by other reproducibility studies may lead to changing in policies and practices in the social behavioral sciences. Okay, Nick. So th- this obviously has a really big deal for us in the scientific community because I mean that's part of where human factors comes from, right? I mean, there's journals dedicated only to human factors science. Uh, so. What are you what are you really thinking about the fact that from 21 studies that were trying to be reproduced only 13 were able to make the cut. So what I think this is saying is that we have no idea how to study human behavior. I think there are too much variables going on, but I also think people are doing bad science. I think it's a mix of both, right? I don't think it's just one thing or the other. I think 
a lot of it is probably the bad science and and defining these variables that are going to be able to reproduce across different studies right that's something that as a scientist you got to do your dil- due diligence and really think ahead and say how can my uh how can my study be replicated later and how do i write this in the most effective way to say to researchers going forward that define the constraints i guess physical um methodological all these other factors with this thing how do i define all this all this to say how do i (laughs) it's a tuesday how do i define all these things to make sure that somebody can pick up my paper and act as a blueprint to say this is how i did the study and if you follow these instructions to the t you should get the same results and that i think is the problem to me yeah i I really don't understand where the problem's coming from, but I want to pull on a couple of threads that are sitting in the article that I think are important to mention here. So this is a a direct quote from the article, right? So there's no standard criteria to determine whether a study has been successfully replicated. So I think that's ultimately a problem here, especially when we're talking about in social or behavioral sciences, right? Because it's different when we're talking about maybe something that's going on in the the biological medical field, right? You've got to be able to reproduce like outcomes of drugs or if you're testing a new, you know, biological allergen or whatever you're doing, there the methods have to be very, very lined out and they have to meet FDE standards and you have to do so many, you know, drug trials, whatever. But in the social sciences, I feel like we're a little less stringent when it comes to the replicability of something. That's a fair point. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think the stakes are also higher too when it comes to medical testing because yeah. that is potentially somebody's life on the line if you're testing a new medicine if you're testing a new device that you know could potentially be dangerous that's lives on the line now psychological research is not as critical i would say to sort of the life and death um possibilities right i think they can inform life and death situations like how we react under certain circumstances under stress in um in critical situations but it's not directly impacting. It's not like people are going to use these devices, these studies as devices. I, I don't know how to. How, you get what I'm saying, though, right? Like, yeah, I, under, I understand the concept, <laughs> but I still think that's why we're seeing this kind of what what seems like a very exaggerated gap of not being able to reproduce studies. Now, to to kind of pull on this again, like we're talking 21 full studies and only 13. Uh, produce the same results as the original. So really, this is saying that eight studies did not. And I think your point is very valid, Nick. I don't know that in the world that we're from or the, in the psychological background that every study that was produced, maybe even maybe in human factors, maybe in just behavioral science itself, I don't know if they're all necessarily built to be replicated or if that was the plan originally. Because as we, as we kind of talk about it now, that ability to replicate an original study is more of a tenet of the scientific method versus a requirement. Sure. But also when you, I don't know, when you introduce variability with human subjects, right? That's, that's something that the scientific method can't account for. Um, be, I, I don't know. It, it, it's weird because if you think about randomness, there's no randomness when it comes to physics. Uh, there, there are, certain variables like when you get into the medical field that could go one way or the other but you'll it's biology it's typically going to behave in a certain way that you expect human behavior is completely unpredictable in times and that's why we try to study it we try to get a lock on this thing and i just think that as scientists we need to be more prescriptive in how we define these studies so that people can replicate like if i said Blake, I tested five people who used this pencil to write these words. Is that enough? Is that enough for you to replicate that? Well, if no, it's not because did you, what instructions did you give them? What kind of pencil did you use? What did you have them write? What was like specific small characteristics about the person? Okay, so but that's like that's what's ingrained in our like ability to write academic papers, right? You have sure. to write this really thick methodology methodology section so people can replicate your studies, right? But I'm going to bring this up again. We, as the scientific community, especially in behavioral sciences, 
we're kind of up against these two forces. We're up against this force of wanting to do good science, but we're also, academics, are up against this force of needing to produce content, needing to produce studies to get tenure, to get, uh, you know, basically stay on their job for the rest of their lives so they can do more studies. It's a catch-22 because the academic system rewards quantity and not quality of research. And it's a tough battle, right? Because uh, we're, we're getting down a rabbit hole here and it's not necessarily, but you get what I'm saying with that pressure to do many studies versus just quality studies, you are losing, something is slipping through the cracks because it's either rushed, maybe it's not completely thought out, maybe they didn't put all the methods to the T with all the I's dotted in the paper and somebody else can't replicate it. Yeah, and I, th- I still think that even like in the medical community, they're facing some kind of similar pressures, right? Because sure. there, there's definitely like you're facing the hospital or, or the pharmaceutical company or even like the medical institution you work for. So I think that that, I think there's always going to be that business side of pressure that's going to, you know, skew how science is done. And I, I think that ultimately affects what we're seeing here. But at the same time, it's I think it really comes down to the fact that I would like to know a little bit more about these specific studies they're looking at. What 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 was happening? I mean, was it was it always with humans? Were these like animal models? What what were the methods like? Was it because some were, just had bad method sections? Was it what was yeah. the integrity of the scientists that did this? And I'm not I'm not sitting here trying to call anybody out that is doing these studies. Obviously, it's a renowned set of international scientists, but I feel like there's a lot of variables like you've talked about that may be even biasing what we're getting that's not reproducing something. And again, there there's part of me that thinks this is a really good thing anyway. Because, I mean, of 21 studies, only eight of them couldn't be reproduced. Well, that maybe that just means that it's time to look at a, look a little harder at those specific problems that they couldn't reproduce. Right. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, this, this article is spun kind of badly. And I know we, you and I have talked about this on the podcast, like doing good science is like a tenet of why we even got to do it in factors, right? Do good science. Yeah. You want to do, do good it. work. Um, do it. And, <laughs> and add to the field <laughs> in a way that, you know, makes you feel respectable, make you feel like you're an actual scientist. Um, and it, I think it's through things like this, like this reproducibility crisis that we've seen, not just here, but across different papers and different types of journals that have been released, that it's important to really you know, make sure we're upholding those methods across all the things we do. Yeah, so this this article is by Gizmodo, the author Ryan Mandelbaum. He actually makes a great point here towards the end. He said, you know, things are starting to change where, you know, that of the 33 psychology journals, which previously had no transparency policies, 24 of them have now adopted some, um, while 19 have adopted pretty assertive policies, in quotes where uh, you know, more, more scientists are now sharing their data by pre-registering. We talked about that on the show, too, this pre-registering their methods so that way, um, or pre-registering their study, so that way everything's kind of laid out in advance and people can't, like, fudge it. Uh, yeah, no data mining to be right. set around and done and that kind of stuff. Yeah, so they, they basically commit to the experimental design before they collect any data. So, so he does mention that things are changing, which is, is a good thing, I, I think, Sort these sorts of studies where the the replicability pri- crisis is is bringing to light the fact that we need to instill some of these procedures processes in the scientific community to better ensure that we can replicate these things. Yeah, because I mean, all the studies that come out in these kind of papers, I mean, they have far-reaching implications. Maybe it's not as direct as you know, is something safe for somebody to use or something somebody to take. Uh, but understanding the like, human behavior in general, that's something you want to be able to reproduce to to the to like the T that you're able to. Because right, the, like you said, there's large veil of variability in human behavior and people in general. So it's hard to always know that you're going to get 100 percent of the time that uh, type of person X will do this. Um, but I think introducing these kind of more stringent procedures like before you actually run the study and then also like we've talked about with negative consequences of studies that you do or potential like benefits as well as limitations. It's really important to include those types of things. So I think overall this, the article sounds a little bad from the title, but I think it's ultimately leading in a great direction. I agree. All right. Why don't we get into our next story? All right, let's do it. 
So if the, if the entire mechanism of a self-driving car can be used to design glasses that tells the where where the right routes, then it That's could... That's a tongue twister. <laughs> I know. Can you say that again, please? Yes, I can. <laughs> All right. So let's start from the top. <laughs> so if the entire mechanism of a self-driving car can be used to design glasses that tells the wearer the right routes, Nailed it. then it could help many visually impaired people too. This is how Deepway came into being. So an innovation that has the potential to bring the change, Deepway, and an aid, an aid in the form of glasses uses deep learning, particularly the convolutional neural networks, so that they can navigate through the streets. The convolutional neural network classifier is actually trained on tens of thousands of images, which included all types of roads, so both physical roads and different off-roads. And Deepway's creator used a type of laptop to interface two servos that could press against one side of a person's head to indicate which direction they should move, so providing some kind of feedback about movement. And the system also tells the user about the people around them, as well as stop signs and other signs on the road using earphones. So, Nick, this is analogous to something we've talked about before on this on the show that Microsoft has made, right? Where it kind of describes the scene around you, right? Yeah, is it's that... very just it's very verbal only. I think, right? Well, I mean, this is this is a little bit more, right? Because you have the verbal descriptions of what's going on around you. It's also using artificial intelligence to identify sort of these um, these things out in the environment, right? There's a there's a person to your left. There's a street sign to your right that says this. There's a, a storefront to your right it says this it's a it's a coffee shop um but it also has this haptic feedback for navigational purposes where you can actually uh get this haptic feedback on the side of your head that indicates which way you should be turning and so all this together is what makes it novel i guess right because we've seen technologies like this before we've seen um do you remember that story it was probably about a year and a half ago where uh it was like the runners down the line where they had the sonic beams that were oh that's right yeah so it was keeping them like within the lane within the lane yeah Yeah. i I love these stories that talk about accessibility with visually impaired individuals yeah because we had that one we had an application on a phone that was actually helping people just to like navigate the streets through auditory feedback right and then we have microsoft's kind of uh implementation in the game but i think this particular I think it's it's called deep way so they just bring in a whole lot more information to be able yeah. to like make decisions from this this cnn the convolutional neat neural network that they're using to kind of help them make decisions and learn about what's going on in the street because i mean this takes a chess camera into into play it's done some analysis on images from the local area and then it's kind of pumping out and giving you different directional feedback from not just the verbal cues in the headphones but also to that like tactical turn right, turn left. And I wonder why, and I don't know, maybe this was just ease of implementation, but why was the head that they're giving that kind of feedback on only? I don't know. If, if you're looking at the, uh, the accompanying B-roll, <laughs> I love that term. If you're, if you're looking at the B-roll, there's, there's these images of um, sort of, it's like a motor on these glasses that kind of push in this little uh, tack into your cheek. So it's like, it's very subtle. And I, I have a feeling that this is probably if they're building in this sort of navigation piece to uh, uh, headphones, right? Th- that's already on your head. Why not just make it all one unit, right? So that's kind of my thinking for why they decided to go with the haptic feedback on the head rather than anywhere else. Sure, because it's already built in. It's you're already getting everything processed through this this head device, and it's just like a little poke on on the side. It's like very non invasive. It's it's a uh, it's pretty neat. Yeah, and I think it also might have the added benefit for those with low vision, maybe not in complete blindness, because potentially they might be wearing glasses anyway if they use them to just, like, read normal signs or anything like that. So that's that's right. another helpful feature if it's just, like, if it's something you're already wearing and it's just, like, attachment style, and then, and then plus the auditory feedback, it's just a, a great... I don't know. It's just a great combination of all sorts of technologies. But I, the thing that blows me away is just the neural network aspect of it. And it's just kind of learning based on the environment that it's in or it, the data that it's being fed is probably the better way to put it. Yeah, we've seen some crazy, uh, crazy, scary, I guess, applications of, of uh, deep learning in the last year. And I mean, it, you know, it's not all used for evil, but um, this is an example where it can be used for something positive. And I like these stories because they kind of they're uplifting rather than, uh, you know, people replacing 
faces of political figures and voices of political figures saying things saying horrible things they shouldn't have said in the first place yeah. yeah i mean well i mean it's not like we had a shortage of that anyway oh my no goodness uh, talking politics on the show all right yeah i mean you know <laughs> but yeah this is cool i like i like this a whole lot um and uh it'd be ex- exciting to see what the next steps for something like this would be like i don't know we can speculate a little bit what do you think could be added to something like this to make it um to improve it well it talks a little bit about the next iteration that the, that the maker wants to make is adding in like GPS data to make the location a little more localized because right, right now it's just it's kind of going based off of what the the images that have been fed to the deep learning network and without like being able to like place it too many into into very like direct location so that would be really cool um, honestly I would like to see something that's not at, like right now it's got two servos on the side of glasses right. I feel like there's a little bit more elegant solutions that are not that far out of reach. Sure, I mean, might this be is, able to use. Yeah, this is a prototype, right? I mean, yeah, and, and it's very obviously a prototype because you can see all the computer parts sticking out too. I mm-hmm. mean, yeah, I, I agree. I think subtle vibrations on the side of your glasses could work just as well. And I know, like, uh, and I hopefully somebody's actually, or maybe we should reach out to the the guy who's making this thing. But I feel like, um, what's the company? It's one of the social media companies. Oh, Apple, it's, it's Snapchat. Snapchat. Snapchat has spectacles that I know a lot of people have like retrofitted the glasses and you and are using the cameras for some kind of applications like this, where they've it's basically sunglasses that already have cameras in them that are meant to work with Snapchat itself. Beach spy cams. Yeah, there you go. Beach spy cams. But it's <laughs> it's one of those things that I feel like it's uh, again you you can get away from like the chest mounted aspect of things because you should still be able to get a lot of degrees of freedom with just things being on the person's head. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure, and, and especially yeah, you're right because I didn't even think about that. It, the the visuals are decoupled from what the uh, individual is looking at, right? So so imagine a world where the sort of auditory feedback that they're getting from the deep learning algorithm that's interpreting the world around them. Imagine if that is tailored to where their head is pointing so they can understand how the world changes as their head changes, not as their body changes. And it's a more natural movement because then they are directing their head in the, in the attention of um, different things within the environment. And this also serves another purpose too, which is potentially a little less obvious. But if you think about sort of, um, visually impaired individuals and how they converse with others, sometimes it can be a a little unnerving to the people who are talking to them because they're not making direct eye contact. They're not looking in their direction, but they're listening and they're internalizing everything that the the person is saying to them with this. It would almost train them to tilt their head in a direction in which they want to get more information about, which could potentially have benefit on these interpersonal um, interactions. Yeah, it could have a whole different world of social yeah. interaction, right? Because if it's on your head, not versus your chest, you know, kind of based on the feedback you're getting, where to look and things like that. So, right. yeah, that's a great implication of this stuff. Man, that was fun. That was a good. That was a good breakdown. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So I told you we're going to do the Patreon commercial later on. We'll be back to break down the rest of it right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. I like that placement much better. That's like right in the middle of the show. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Before we move on, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Gizmodo, Geospatial World, and Communications ACM for all of our stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or join our Slack. We post links to the original articles as we find them. Okay, Blake, while you do the next story, I'm going to look up Reddit posts because we totally forgot to do that this week. (laughs) I got one for you. So, all right. Researchers at Boston... (laughs) 
Jones. Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School have developed a less invasive device to emulate the Forker technique. A surgery performed on children with rare congenial lung defects. Nailed so this is where doctors attach sutures to part of a infant's esophagus, then tie them off on the back on the back of the baby. So over time, the sutures lengthen in the esophagus by pulling on it and then stimulating tissue growth. So the device has this, the same general goal as the Forker technique, but it stimulates growth by gradually pulling on a tissue segment while monitoring and controlling the forces applied, leading to greater precision. The implanted, implanted in the esophagus, the robot consists of concentric rings that promote tissue growth by expanding or moving apart from each other, and a motor that drives the expansion and sensors to measure how much force is applied to the tissue, providing valuable feedback for surgeons performing the Forker technique today who rely largely on just empirical data to inform their training. So this data is transferred via a cable to a microcontroller in a small external vest, which then transmits to a laptop via Bluetooth. And in animal experiments, the ro robot coaxed the esophagus into growing 77% over nine days. Now, I don't know what the comparison is to, you know, physical doctors doing this, but it sounds like a large growth rate over a pre pretty reasonable amount of time. But, Nick, this is incredible. Again, we're seeing another application of small robots in the medical field to help with, in this case, a procedure that can save children. Yeah, and, and you were asking about what the sort of... Uh what it looks like today, right? And um, I have that for you. I'm looking for it. Basically, uh, it is today. I'm looking for it. I'm looking. I, I I had it somewhere. I had it. Dang it! I lost it. Anyway, I think it's I think it's about two weeks, and they have to be carefully monitored. Um, oh yeah, here we go. Uh, no, I lost it. All right, no, I don't have it. But I, I'm pretty sure it it. Uh, lasts about two weeks where um, they have to be carefully monitored in the situation. And this is just kind of adding that additional precision to it, reducing the amount of time and, um, and uh, you know, less invasive. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> Tuesday, Tuesday it's, folks, Tuesday. It, it's funny when we, it's funny to think now that when we talk about robots, we can also put less invasive in the title with it. Right. Because a, a while ago, you would have thought the complete opposite. But I think this is just a nice mirroring of the use of robotic technology plus how it aids not not only a, a child, but also aids a surgeon in doing their job correctly or doing a job more uh, more effectively in a case where there's there's a lot of kind of, you know, things have to be precise. You have to make sure that the infant is taken care of. And hopefully with things like this external vest that's actually able to produce some of the information to a laptop and to other kind of, systems that doctors will interact with, you don't have to monitor them as closely. Like maybe some of the algorithms that are sitting behind the program are actually able to help them, you know, make decisions about what's going on. How's the Forker technique gone? Do we need to make any adjustments? Is everything going to be all right? Or are we ahead of schedule, behind schedule? So I think it's a nice marriage of a lot of technology in the existing medical practice of the Forker technique. Yeah, it's Foker. Uh, <laughs> we've both been saying it wrong. That's okay. Foker technique. Oh, man. Did uh, Google Auto correct that? <laughs> yeah, it straight up says Forker technique. Oh, really? All yeah. right. Well, then thanks, Google. Thanks a lot. No, I think this is great for a variety of reasons. This is just sort of an indication of the trend in medical science to be less invasive, to sort of optimize these processes that we've seen over time, you know, and, and the fact that we're finding and using technology to sort of implement these uh, techniques on a more precise level. Uh, I'm using the terminology from the, <laughs> from the, the, the article here. Ah, it's a Tuesday. All right. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just done. blaming it on I'm this poor Tuesday. Blaming it's it on the wonderful Tuesday. day of the week. Uh, I think it's great because it, it, it puts, <laughs> thanks for saving me. <laughs> <laughs> it puts surgeons back in a, in a position where they're, not having to worry as much on the 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 actual movements with that are regarded with a procedure, right? They're more focused on what technology do I have at my disposal that's going to allow me to do this as safely as possible and then have other benefits as well, like, you know, low recovery times or even, you know, it's a better option or a safer option than anything else that we have at our disposal right now. Maybe it even costs less because it's robotic and now, so maybe it takes less people to even be in the OR to even have this thing uh you know, in administered. Um, and it's, it's great to see, cause I, I don't know about you, but I remember when I was looking at grad schools, like nanotechnology was a really big thing, or maybe that was even just 
undergrad. And then mm. it just kind of disappeared. It wasn't yeah. as big in the sphere of things. And I think like now with robot, tiny robotics and nanotechnology, we've seen a lot of that coming into the medical field and what it can do in terms of like healing wounds in, in after after surgery or like taking care of getting rid of stitches inside of your body. Um, so it, I feel like robots and nanomachines have really found their home in the medical field. And it's just, it's bringing all sorts of really cool leaps and bounds forward for, for surgeons, for patients, and for just practitioners in general. Yeah, I'm trying to think of sort of how else or, or what, what the future looks like for surgery and uh, sort of these, these micro robotics. And to me, what this says is that they're, the doctors are going to be in more of a supervisory role. They're going to be auditing these automated processes, and they're, not, they're no longer going to be um, – they're still going to require the knowledge, right, the, the deep sort of understanding of how these mechanisms work. And um, so they'll still need that, but it's, it's going to be more hands-off and watch the process go. And if any complications arise, they got to step in. And I feel like automation is heading that way with a lot of fields, right? Especially with like AI. If you think about sort of um, like think about how the field of archaeology has changed. Now we're doing archaeology from satellites where artificial intelligence is picking out these pictures and having the uh, I forget what it's it's like astro astro archaeologist. That's what it is. Astro archaeologists are looking at pictures from satellites and using supervisory control, or, or they're, they're in the supervisory role to say, oh, this is an interesting picture. There's probably something there. Let's go dig it up. Um, you know, where before it was just kind of educated guess. We know this this tribe of people were here, so let's go dig something up. Uh, I, I'm being very sort of um, flippant about my use of dig something up. There's obviously processes in place to do that. But I'm thinking that the medical field will very much follow the same trend where, you know, they'll, they'll get this data from this micro robot or whatever, and they will basically step in and say, oh, it's doing its job fine. The process is going well. Uh, or, oh, this is going horribly wrong. How can I fix it? Yeah. Hopefully more of the first one than the second one. <laughs> I think they're going to be able to make much more informed decisions and like tailored operations to the person's body because of how much information we're constantly starting to collect on ourselves just on our own basis, like with Fitbits right. and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And then like add the the benefits of just imaging technology and uh, then let's let's tie together robotic surgery and then robots that can do things on their own to where you're basically programming – a doctor spends spends his or her time like analyzing the output of you know data analytics based on this specific patient and what kind of nano routines can I run that are gonna you know rebuild this person's organ or is gonna perform the set of surgeries they need with the like with the least amount of recovery time and the least risk to them. I, just, I think it's just gonna make medical practices more precise. And I know there's gonna be a lot of time in between now and then, but nonetheless, I think it's. It's just a cool set of stories, and I want I want some robots to do surgeries on me now. Some robots, uh, yeah. yeah. Wait, what kind of surgeries? Ah, uh, any that I have to do in the future, I don't know. <laughs> All right, well those those are some cool stories, but you know what time it is. And I, quick side note, what Blake, time is it? <laughs> hang on, hang on, hang on. Quick, well, you know what? Hang on, never mind. Here we go. It came from. It came from. That's right, it came from Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community's talking about. Any subreddit's fair game, as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion amongst the community. Now, what I was going to say before that break was Blake and I forgot to do Reddit this week, but that's okay because we have a feed coming in of Reddit stories, and boy, oh boy, there's a lot of good stuff today. I picked like four while you were reading that story. Oh, did you? Just at a glance. Look at so, that. Let's go through them. I know you picked one. I want to get to yours first. So why don't why don't you go ahead and read that one? We're going to switch it up today. Blake, oh, my ahead. goodness. I'm going to read that one. Okay. So this was posted by, I'm going to say it this way, B Serum. Uh, so practicing professionals, are you being tasked to help or manipulate users? Ooh, I had that one too. Okay, I can delete that one. All right. Great. All right so a little bit more from B Serum. So an understanding of user behavior can be used to cater to cater an experience to their benefit. The same understanding can be used to manipulate users to exploit a cognitive heuristic to create a dark pattern or simply craft an, intera- an interface that maximizes business objectives with no concern for users' preferences. I'm curious how you would 
quote unquote guesstimate the percentage of activity devoted to one or to the other. Uh, so when I read this at first, I was, I thought it was a great one to pull in because we had that story about like the re- reproducibility of the sure. scientific articles. Right. Yeah. And I think it's just important to think about. I mean, if you feel like in your job that as a pricing professional, you are having to manipulate users uh, in the in the sense of if this is like a dark pattern or you feel like you're only maximizing benefit benefits to business outcomes versus no real you know personal outcome for the user or providing a service that is useful to them i think you you know that that's happening and you have to you know kind of pull the curtain back on yourself and ask is this something i really want to be a part of okay before we go on i just want to i want to mention something that is probably going to make me seem like a super villain here Manipulate is not a bad word. No, it's not. It's not, right? So manipulate, according to Google, is to handle or control a tool or mechanism, typically in a skillful manner. There's nothing there about ill intentions. I understand what the heart of this question is asking, but at the same time, we do both. As human factors practitioners, we both manipulate and help, or at least that should be our mission statement, right? We want to manipulate them by giving them affordances on whatever they're looking at. You know, do the buttons afford this interaction? Does um, you know the physical, does the handle on the cup afford uh, that you can grab it, right? Like yeah. that's manipulating someone to do the thing that you are designing the thing to do. And I'm being very sort of um, nebulous with my word thing because it's it, it could be anything that you're designing, right? You are manipulating the user to use that in such a way that benefits them. Hopefully, that's your goal. Well, I mean, to, we can even get a, like one deeper or one level lower there. I mean, even in psychological science, a lot of what was studied or is studied is uh, it's it's called like enhancement to behaviors, but really it's manipulating behavior for the for better outcomes for the person. So if this is like if right. you have like problems with negative thoughts, what coping strategies can you use to manipulate your own behavior? Right. So I think I think somehow manipulate has gotten a bad rap or it's just been used in negative context over and over because it, it right. is part of our job. I mean, we're, nip, we're manipulating behavior. We're designing interfaces to make people interact with them in a certain way. Now, there is a nefarious path that they do mention in here about are you creating some kind of dark pattern? And there there is a lot to be said about that, especially in the climate of like social media. And you have to be very, very careful with what you expose people to at a young age. Um, but. Okay, so the real crux of the question is if you had to guesstimate the percentage that you're doing one or the other, uh, I don't really think that I'm doing any dark pattern design in the in my current jobs now. So I guess zero there. I mean, most of what I'm doing is really it is manipulating behavior, but again, it's augmenting existing behaviors with redesigns right. of systems or even what I when I teach. I mean, it's more so it's more so about like augmenting people's toolkits. Yeah, I yeah, I agree. Uh so there's there's a comment here on this on this Reddit post that I want I know that I want to talk about because this is from Synaxia, I guess. I don't know. So there's this manipulation matrix. Have you heard of this thing? No. Um basically the two factors here are does it improve the user's life and does the maker use it? Um if both are no, then you're a dealer. If both are yes, then you're a facilitator. If it doesn't improve the life of the user, but you still use it, you're an entertainer. If it does improve the life, but you don't use it, you're a peddler. I don't know how I feel about this. I think the Matrix but, is ridiculous. But, no, no, no. This makes a good point. I don't agree with maybe the, the uh, what are the, the, I don't agree with this. But what I do agree with is basically measuring this in, in two sort of axes, right? Is it in the user's best interest? And are you manipulating them? And I think that if you're um, if you're operating in the zone where you are manipulating them, but operating not in their best interest, that's the zone that this particular Reddit user of the original post here, uh, B Serum, is is getting at. Right? If you're in this zone, how do you deal with it? And I think part of that comes to you kind of should have an idea of what this company is doing before you sign on. And maybe not, but at the same time, like if you're operating in that zone and you're uncomfortable with it, don't do it. Yeah. And I, th- I do want to point out the fact, and this is, maybe this is just me being me, 
But I think it's important, and I think it's a part of our job. Like you are balancing business objectives with usability or what your users need. Like that is part of designing nowadays. Because if you create a product that's very usable, but people just don't want to use it, then all right, that's great. Um, and so I think there is a fine line to balance here. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of the game is is manipulating people's psychology, make them right. want to interact with something, not make them addicted to it. I think there's a nice yeah. dichotomy there. Uh, that's also where you know the business practice comes in. Are you manipulating somebody to be addicted to it? Like a social media site where you you dribble out sort of these these uh, social reinforcement methods to keep you coming back. Yeah, right. Like that's that would be a manipulation technique. That's a little bit more gray. Yeah, it's it definitely gets in the gray area really quick. Yeah, um, I we have some time to kill, so I want to get through a couple of these because there's, there's a lot of good Reddit this week. Yeah, let's do it. There's a lot of good Reddit. So this one is from uh, Yuli Kunkel on the UX subreddit, ah, user Kunkel. experience subreddit. Sorry, uh, how do UX and marketing fit together, and when are they apart? Um, they go on to write, I always find that this is a hard one to answer. We need to work with marketing since we both have the user slash customer in mind. But for me, it tends to break off from there. I don't believe that UX should ever sit under marketing or in marketing's department. The plans get so muddy when that happens. I struggle to articulate how and when they separate. Marketing, in my experience, tends to have an idea, sell it to business, then bring it to UX rather than work with UX in its inception. How do you talk to a company that doesn't understand or see the difference? You try really hard. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's a great one. It is the best question I've ever read on Reddit. To All be right. Honest. Next one. Let's go. No. <laughs> and next. Yeah, no. uh, you, I'll, I'll let you dive in first since I get to do the first one. Okay, sure. So we have talked about this on the show a couple times, but this is an interesting kind of take on it where they are talking about working with them to kind of uh, maximize the benefit to the user. And it seems like marketing while ultimately they are trying to appeal to the user to get them to use this product or whatever the whatever the marketing scheme I, I, that's that's a bad word whatever the marketing uh manipulation manipulation is <laughs> <laughs> like i i don't know so so where do these things overlap and where do they separate well i think ux and marketing have a lot in common in the sense that they are working for the user i think ux is optimizing processes and procedures and interaction for the user with whatever the product is and marketing is optimizing the appeal of the product and i i do see them as two separate areas marketing has a very specific goal of trying to get somebody to use this product that they're not currently using Am I wrong in that assessment? No, but I, th I think there's a few things there, right? They're trying to onboard customers, sustain customers, and then even maybe gain back ones they've lost. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So there's a couple mission statements there, but but ultimately they're trying to get somebody to use the product, right? You can you can break it down in those ways. And to do, the like you said, the onboarding and the gaining back, I think that has a lot to do with UX. If your system's not usable, if it's not sort of... Um, intuitive for the user to it's not tailored for them then they're gonna have a much harder time uh staying on board i think they both serve the same purpose of trying to get someone to use the product but the separation for me is that one is the facilitator of sort of these processes procedures methods of interaction with the product and the other one is trying to manipulate users to get them on boarded yeah and I again manipulate's not a bad word no it's not a bad word it's just an m-word uh, but I think I think there's two parts that I want to tackle. Nick, I think you're hitting it right on the head, right? And the one part that I'll, I want to bring up is I feel like in a lot of companies, your marketing team, that's the people who've got so much data they've collected on your potential users that really they are such an asset to a UX like person's team right. or like a like if you if you find yourself within marketing. Maybe this this is where I get a little confused because I could I could see somebody wanting like a UX professional, whether it's design or research related in their marketing department, because if it's something like onboarding retention or like regrabbing old people. Right. It could it could be like optimizing the process to onboard people. Yeah. What can we change in our design? There's a lot of really great places for you to be. But I also see that there there's a need to like draw the distinction of what's the difference between the two of us. And I think you were right on it. I mean, you're optimizing processes, 
types of interactions, trying to design something that people really want to use. And marketing is kind of giving you some of the data to be able to make good design decisions because they're, they, they're collecting so much from so many different channels. Um, the one part that I want to kind of call out at the end of that Reddit post, it was talking about like how, how do you like voice your opinions of how do we, how are we better integrated? How can I get more to the more towards the beginning of the process? Right. And I think that's, that's an ongoing problem you're going to find in any kind of cross functional team, whether it's with developers, stakeholders, interacting with like clients, anything, you're just going to have to kind of figure out how to speak that department's language. So, and also maybe even provide them some upfront value to be able to, you know, have them roll you in earlier in the process. I think it's just a, it's something you have to work on. And that right there, what you just said is absolutely true when you're working with any, any thing separate from UX. If you're working with developers, you have to provide ROI. You have to tell them why this is important for the user. If you're talking to the C-suite, executives you have to advocate for why your role is important uh it's something that we bring up time and time again evangelize ux evangelize human factors and its importance in um in the user's life cycle yeah because keep in mind right now especially like people in user experience or ux and to some degree people in human factors but definitely like any, if your job title has UX in it, you are, have really have a leg up because people know that they need you but are not quite sure what how? they're supposed to do. Yeah. Well, how, how do you integrate with their team? They just know that they need that name in their company. And you've got to be the one to figure out and show them the way that you integrate and what you're providing and what you need to be able to do your job. Yeah. I will bring up one more point. So it could be argued that the role of a marketer is not to design for the user, but rather to design for the company because their primary goal is to get revenue for the company. It's to get people on board, which means money for the company. And so maybe it's not at the user's best interest, but I just wanted to throw that out as kind of like a devil's advocate. I tend to take the more optimistic route. They are just trying to get someone to use their product because they know it's a good product, um, which might not necessarily be true. So and again, I I want to reiterate that even if that's not true, if they are like if they don't have any stake in whether they this part, that it's a useful product or whatever it is, they just want the revenue in the door. They're likely collecting metrics on people that are going to help the UX suite or design team or whatever make good decisions. And I just want to reiterate. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we just we could go on and on and on. There is a one. I was going to talk about this one, but I don't think we're going to do it. I, I do want to mention one other thing, and I usually keep up with these, which is shocking to me that I found out about this through Reddit today. I mean, maybe not because I've been offside all day. Anyway. I can't even believe you. So there is, I just want to clue in all of our listeners to uh, Humble Bundle. If you're not familiar with this, they usually offer like a bunch of games or a bunch of books for a discount price. You basically donate as much as you want, and you can you know, determine how much of that goes to charity, how much of that goes to the developers, how much of that goes to the authors, whatever it is. Um, th right now, there is a humble book bundle for UI and UX out there. Um, I haven't seen this yet, so I'm just looking at this for the first time, and I'm actually very happy with some of the things on there. At the first tier, pay $1 or more, you get Evil by Design, a book that I have recommended multiple times on the show. Yeah, that's that's in your office right now. That isn't is it? in my office on my shelf. There's also usable usability, uh, designing the Internet of Things, and design for hackers. That's at the one dollar tier. Uh, again, we're not getting a cut of any of this. I just want to let you guys know because this is this is a pretty no, I'm so good. So glad you just found this. This is a pretty good deal, and I will definitely be buying this right after this. Uh, again, we do not get a cut of this. This is just. To let you guys know, these are all ebooks. It's a happy Reddit action uh, right now. This is, yeah, this is really great. Uh, if you pay $8 or more, you also unlock the essential guide to user interface design, um, designing search, Android design patterns, communicating the user experience, and type rules. And then at the 15, whoa, I know. If, if you get, if you, this is just $15, you get About Face, you get Designing for the Digital Age, Handbook of Usability Testing, Understanding Color. Um, and designing information, human factors, and common sense in information design. So there's a lot of really, really great books in this bundle. I highly recommend you go do this. Um, if you, for anybody that doesn't know, About Face on its own will go for like 30 bucks. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, you get more than your money's worth for $15, especially if you're like 
just getting into the field. These, This is like stuff that you want on your bookshelf. I will also say that you can support charity by buying these. Like I said, you can, um, you can allocate your spending as much as you'd like. Uh, and the charities for this one are First Book and Crisis Text Line. So uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that because this is a, a phenomenal deal. It looks like it'll be up for 12 days. So, you know, it'll be up longer than our contest is. But please, 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 like, if you're even thinking about this, this is a bunch of Wiley books uh, for UI, UX, and I would highly recommend. I am literally buying this as we speak. So We're on the Home Shopping Network. You can <laughs> we, find Human ca- Factors Cast over yeah, here. Yeah, you can find Human Factors Cast on the Home Shopping Network. All right. Well, Blake, you know what time it is. Is it time for something else? It's not time for something else. It's time to say goodbye. All right. That's it for today, everyone. <laughs> Remember to enter that contest. Uh, we got a bunch of different ways you can enter. Link is in the description. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. If you're a Patreon supporter, stay tuned for the after show. That'll come a little bit later this week. Uh, for the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack. Follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Be sure to drop us a comment on our SoundCloud or leave us an email at uh, humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're feeling saucy, you can leave a voicemail at 901 646 1432. That's 901 646 1HFC. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. Blake, did you know you can get an entry? You get five entries for reviewing us on any of those platforms. I didn't five, know that. Five whole entries for your chance to win. That is five free. steps closer to getting into HFES for free. Yes, it is. All right. If you want to join the after show party, you can support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank my favorite co-host for being on the show today, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Where can our listeners find you? You can find me all over the place on social media at Don't Panic UX. Excellent. Special thanks to Jeff Olson for our video editing this week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. depends.